praise the Lord. Praise him from whom all blessings flow. I hope that you received a church bulletin this morning. And I uh, hope you'll look at the announcements, especially our senior adults are having a breakfast at 9 o'clock in the morning on Thursday. Uh, some of you are going to have to wait uh, two or three hours. Cause I know, George, you probably eat breakfast at 7 o'clock, but you have to wait a little bit that it's, uh, we say senior adult breakfast, but if you're below senior adult age, whatever that might be, just come join us, 9 o'clock Thursday morning. And they would like to know how many are going, so if you will uh, let us know, go by the bulletin board and sign it up. Thank you for being a part of the 30th Avenue Baptist Church this morning. We welcome you to the service. If you're looking by Facebook or YouTube, we're certainly glad to have you part of the worship service. The Word of God says in Psalm 105, Give thanks to the Lord. Call on His name. Make known among the nations what He has done. Sing to Him. Sing praise to Him. Tell of His wonderful acts. Father, we could go on and on and as the psalm says, count your many blessings, name them one by one. And Father, we could just keep on numbering and numbering the blessings you have given us. Most of all, Father, we're thankful for the gift of eternal life, that you so loved each one of us, that you gave your only begotten Son, that we, through him, may have eternal life. Father, I thank you for this worship time today. I thank you for our music team. I thank you for our pastor. I pray that you direct each phase of this service that we may honor you. Father, I do pray for those who may not be able to be with us in person today. Some have sicknesses, some have broken bones, or some have uh, situations that they're not able to come. And Father, I pray that you would be with each one. I pray that you'd be with Brother Mike as he has a heart cath this week. I pray that you'd be with others who have particular needs. Most of all, Father, I pray that you would bless us throughout this service, that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts may be acceptable in your sight. For you are our strength and our redeemer, in whose name I pray. Amen. 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 This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Let's sing. As we stand as we sing, I'm so glad Jesus lifted me.
Jesus lifted me as you may be seated as we sing to him. I am thine, O Lord.
me where would I be if it had not been for the Lord on my side. Join us as we sing the song Living Hope. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into Thank you. 
chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ. again. seated, you may be seated. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light. Till the heaven you came running, there's mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King. Despise the cross, for even in your suffering, you saw through the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus, our I say, you died. Praise the Father. Praise the Son. heaven held his heart till the stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels 
stood in all for the souls of all who come to the Father all restored and the church of Christ was born then the spirit in the flame now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel shall not fade by his blood and all his name in the freedom I am free for the love of Jesus Christ who resurrected me sing with me morning to you. It's a delight to see you. Thank you for choosing to be here today on this morning. The Lord will bless you. There's no question in my mind. Some are not able to. Others have chosen other things. Those who want to be here, the Lord will bless. There's no question in my mind. None whatsoever. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're going to read an extensive passage. There will not be a um, PowerPoint this morning, but we'll read 7 through 18. Please find this and stand in honor of the Word of God, if you would, please. This is what the Lord says to us in this passage of Scripture. In, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 7, the Word of God says this, But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even that was what for even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away, but their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. 
But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Please, Father, give us wisdom and discernment. Speak to our hearts today. Let our attention be focused on what the Spirit will say to this church on this day, in this hour, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The Bible teaches us that God has one overarching objective, one purpose for your life. When God saves you by placing your faith, by your placing your faith in the work of Jesus on the cross and in the resurrection, when he does this, then his purpose is for you to be conformed to the image of Christ. When we read in Romans chapter 8 where he says we've been predestined to be conformed to his image, what he's saying to you very simply in that passage of Scripture, the predetermined plan of God for everyone who repents and believes on the Lord Jesus Christ is that ultimately they look like Jesus. Their character becomes like Jesus. Their values are the values of Lord Jesus, and you become like Jesus in your communication. And thankfully, one day we will become like Jesus in our translation, in the changing of this old, decrepit, worn out, wearing out. Some of you say, I'm not worn out. Get ready. Wearing out body. It's coming your way. Adrian Rogers said, the, the mark of the ministry of any pastor is this. Are you over time, becoming more like Christ Jesus. If that over time is not what a pastor sees, then it may well be that pastor has failed. In my case, me, I, have failed in my ministry. Or it could be that you have failed in your reception of the Word of God. That too. That's what pastoral ministry is all about. Why, let me show it to you. In Ephesians 4, turn there if you would, just a few pages forward from 2 Corinthians. Turn there and look at Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 11, and what the Word of God says to us in this passage of Scripture. Scripture says this. In verse 11, Ephesians 4, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Watch this. Till we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Do you see that? God wants you to come to this place where you are filled up in your spirit with Christ Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? This is what the Lord says to you and to me. What I want to begin to show you this morning, and we will continue through it next week, is the transforming power of God for that 
person who repents and turns to Jesus Christ for salvation. And this passage before us that we read, an extensive passage, I understand, and with Paul's writing, very long sentences, sometimes complicated looking, and I promise you I don't know how many times I read it and reread it to try to grab a hold of the truths that were in it, we will learn the entire process of salvation from condemnation all the way to glorification. <clears throat> this is what the Word of God teaches. This morning, I will share with you two simple principles out of five that I found in this passage of Scripture. The two that I will share with you this morning is the, are the principle of condemnation and then later the principle of justification. These two and only these two, though I'd love to preach a full hour and share it all with you. I know better than to do that. Now, if we were at the 1030 service in Spanish, I'd probably do it, but not here. Not now. So listen to the Word of God, and let's study and see what God says to us. First, with the principle of condemnation. You see, those from Jerusalem who had arrived with letters of commendation that we mentioned uh, last week, these were men who brought with them the letter of condemnation. In verse 6, the Word of God tells us the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And they were seeking to bring the Corinthians under the Judaic law once again, including the oral traditions about the law, not just the law, but the Talmud, which included all of the commentary, the running commentary of a lot of rabbis about the law. That law, that thing that the Pharisees would use to say you had to wash your hands in seven water pots before you had a meal. You said a prayer as you went through each one of those things. And you had to uh, on the Sabbath day, you could only do this, that, or the other. And if you did any more than that, then you were unworthy as a, as a person. And they took these things and they, they carried it all the way down into extremities and do so to this day. Do so to this very day. Let me tell you something, though, about the law, the law of God, the law of Moses, those Ten Commandments and other things that you see in Scripture. Let me tell you some things about that. The law is beautiful. The law is beautiful. The Bible says in our passage of Scripture in verse 7 that it was glorious, as a matter of fact. This is what Scripture says about it. There's nothing unseemly about the law. There's nothing ugly intrinsically about the law. The law is glorious. The law displays God's standard of holiness and perfection to you and to me. Now I want to take you, we're going to be going back and forth in this already, but I want to take you back to Romans 7 for just a few moments. And look back here in Romans 7, and I want you to see some things about it. And he's speaking about the law here in Romans 7. And, uh, and, and in verse 6 of Romans 7, he says this truth. This is great. We have been delivered from the law. But having died to what we were held by so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. The, when he says the letter, he's speaking of the law there. What shall we say then? Verse 7. Is the law sin? Certainly not. These words are important for you and for me. It is the law that works in your heart. Because you see, here's what the law does. The law, as beautiful it is, the law binds us. It binds us at this moment. The law boxes you in, if I can say it that way. Keep reading here in Romans 7. 
where I stopped in verse 7. Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. I just finished. I've done this with you many years ago, but I just completed um, a, a series with our Hispanic group um, on the Ten Commandments. And we walked through all of the Ten Commandments because there is this notion today that you unhitch yourself from the Old Testament. In fact, a prominent SBC pastor announced to his church and then on social media that we should unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. Ladies and gentlemen, the Old Testament reveals Christ just as much as the New Testament reveals Christ Jesus. The Old Testament, these laws, this, these Ten Commandments that God has given us demonstrate to us our sin nature. They demonstrate to us that we are bound up and in need of being set free. That's what they show. So Paul says in Romans 7, later in this passage, I would not have known that I coveted, except the law says you shall not covet. And then he discovered how many different ways that he could covet because of the law. And the Bible shows us that. So whenever you read the Old Testament, and you should, those standards that are laid out remind you that you have a sin nature. The law reveals that you do not and that you cannot achieve the glory of God. The Bible says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us. The law awakens you to your sentence by the righteous judge. The Bible says, The wages of sin is death. Yes, the law tries you, the law convicts you, and the law sentences you. The Bible says in John chapter 3, then in verse 18, that he that does not believe is condemned already. Why? Because the law has condemned him. The law has declared that he's separated and he's separate from Almighty God in his holiness. That's what it does. So the law, the law is beautiful. The law binds you, but the law buries you. You see back in our text, in, in uh, 2 Corinthians, the Bible calls this, in 2 Corinthians, the ministry of death. In Romans 7, the Bible says, sin taking occasion of the law killed me. The law buries you, ladies and gentlemen, because this is the ministry of the law, death in your life. The letter kills, it's the spirit who gives life. Now many people with whom I have shared the gospel through the years, thought they were doing pretty good compared with other people. When I've spoken with them and I have begun to, in those instances, speak about sin and the, and the, and the sin nature and that we're sinners, many people have said to me, well, you know, I think I'm not doing so bad compared to other people. I'm pretty good. And so I would say to them, well, compared to other people, you are pretty good. But, Let's bring Jesus into the mix. And I'd ask him, ah, uh, Jesus is righteous, right? Perfect, never sinned, right? If they can't get that part right, I have to go back farther. But when they agree to that and they understand that, and I said, well, now suppose that righteous Jesus, perfect Jesus, were right here standing beside you. How would you measure up to him? 
I've had people say to me, that's not fair comparing me to Jesus Christ. Well, that's your standard. You've got to raise your standard. And when you raise the standard, when you raise the bar beyond you and me, other people, and you raise it to who Jesus is, well, things change. Suddenly, we see that we fall short of the glory of God, that we are in trouble. You see, the Bible says, Ephesians chapter 2, that we are dead in our trespasses and sins, each one of us. So the law, ladies and gentlemen, when you discover this is what God says, and you say, oh my, I've sinned. The law has killed you in that moment. The law buries you, <laughs> but the law blinds too. This is what the Bible says. This is where we are in our text, that they were blinded. Why, the, the illustration he uses in 7 through 15 of our passage is about Moses. And Moses, you remember the story. I'm sure that many of you remember the story of how Moses um, had been up on the mountain and he's receiving the principles, not just of the law, but of the building of the tabernacle. And then he goes down the mountain. God says, you better get back down there's a ruckus going on down in the camp Exodus 32 and he comes down and Joshua says something going on down there and Moses knows what it is and they get down there and you know what's happening and it's the golden calf and the big the big uh, festival they're having I'm being polite in how I describe that and uh, all of it to a false god and then God says, let me blot them out. And the Lord said, no, 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 no. Moses said, no, you're not going to blot them out. You're not going to do this. Not at all. If you blot them out, blot me out. And then as they're conversing, Moses says, I beseech you, uh, please show me your glory. And he says, uh, Moses, you can't look on me and live. No man can. No one can. But I tell you what I do. Y'all remember the story. Puts him in the cleft of the rock. He passes by and he proclaims his glory as he passes by. Moses stays up there another 40 days and 40 nights that he's up there. 40 days and 40 nights. On that 41st day, he comes down off the mountain and his face is glowing with the glory of God. And the people are terrified because they see the glory of God. And so Moses has to put a veil over his face. He has to cover his face. And I don't think it's just like you see with a lot of people that covers their nose as I understand it. Perhaps it's a sheer cloth because it, it apparently even his eyes are closed. Why do I say that? Because later in the passage, they talk about how they can't see through the veil. And the veil is finally taken away when you find Christ. You remember that? Regardless, he covers his face in their presence. And he removes the veil when he goes into the presence of God. But the people of God, the people of Israel in this case, cannot look on this, this reflected glory that Moses has. Now they call it a passing glory. And the reason they call it a passing glory is that Moses is going to die one day. And so the glory that is with Moses is going to die. Paul uses this as an illustration of the passing glory of the law. We'll get into that in just a moment. But the law, he says, blinds each one of them. They are blinded to the truth. Even to this day, most among Israel are blinded to the truth when they read the Old Testament because they must see Christ in the Old Testament, and they do not. Let me tell you something. If you are depending upon your works to save you, you're blinded to the truth. You have a veil over your eyes. If you are saying it's, it's my faith in Jesus plus baptism that saves me, then you're 
blind. I was sharing the gospel with a young man one time. Somebody was helping me. He was supposed to be sitting there being quiet. Y'all, let me give you a principle. If you go out with Patrick on street lights and you're sharing the gospel and say Patrick is the one sharing the gospel and he's telling someone how to be born again and you're with him, your job is to stand there and pray for the Lord to open their eyes. Your job is not to help Patrick share the gospel. You're to be quiet. Now, I was, I was in there sharing the gospel, and this guy blurted out, Well, you've been baptized, ain't you? And I turned around and looked at him like, What? Where did this come from? If you've been baptized, then you're saved. I thought, glory, I got two people I need to lead to the Lord in here, not just one. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to hear me. If you're trusting any of your works, you're still blind. Because salvation is not of works, it's of grace and faith. Amen? Well, that brings me to the second principle. Told you I'd only get two today out of five. That's justification. Aren't you glad the scripture doesn't stop with Malachi, the final chapter of Malachi in that final verse? Aren't you glad there's more? The gospel, the good news that we can be justified with God. My goodness alive. Let me show you. Look at in our passage of scripture in 2 Corinthians. The Bible says this in verse 16. Chapter 3, nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Isn't that beautiful? I'm going to tell you what happens when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the most beautiful thing in the world. The very first thing, and you know this, you understand this, but the very first word I want to give you is pardon. This is what happens. When we turn to the Lord, he grants us a pardon from the death sentence that has been written over us. Now, all of us watch the president, um, not just this one that we have, but other presidents through our lifetime, if we paid attention to the news, how at the end of the year, and governors do this too, how they will grant a pardon to certain people. And they grant this part. Sometimes we think, that person don't deserve a pardon. I can't believe that person was pardoned. May I tell you something? Every time the Lord pardons someone, when the Lord, God, pardoned you, the devil said, he don't deserve it. She doesn't deserve it. Well, that's absolutely right. That's why it's called a pardon. You don't deserve it. And the devil, the devil shouts that in your ears. And boy, when he shouts it in my ears, you know what I do? I say, you're absolutely right. I do not deserve it. This is why it's called grace and mercy. Out of the mercy of God, God reached down and he cleaned this sorry, filthy animal up and he put me on a rock and he put a new song in my heart and he helps me sing praises to his name. He shows this pardon, ladies and gentlemen, to the devil. When the devil accuses you before God, he shakes that pardon out and he says, Look, by the blood of Jesus, I have pardoned this one. And he emblazes that on your heart and shows you in your heart that you have been forgiven. The second word that I want to give to you is the word purge. P-U-R-G-E, purge. Because you see what the Lord did when you came to him is he purged out the record. You say, what are you talking about? There was a record of charges against you. Every time you violated the law of God, there was something written down about your violation of the word of God. Thou shalt not lie. Every time you lied, God wrote it down. 
every single thing you ever did, every thought you had, every deed you had, every word you spoke, every word you wanted to say, but only thought it, every intent of your heart, everything you should have done but omitted, all of it was written down. Every violation of God's perfect law. But the day you turn to Jesus, God purged that record. And it's all removed from your life. It no longer exists. It's not there. <laughs> the first two are enough. But I got a better one for you. Oh, it's just as good, maybe not better. That's the word purification. Because <laughs> you see, not only does he pardon you, and not only does he purge the record against you, he cleanses you. Whew. He cleanses you from that stain of sin. He takes those dirty garments of self-righteousness and sinfulness. He takes them away and gives you the white raiments of the righteousness of Christ and places them on you. Purification. One more. Peace. When God justifies you, He pardons you. He purges that record against you. He purifies you. Oh, but His peace. Oh, but His peace. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. What a wonderful peace. You're no longer bound by the law. We abuse this verse where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. In fact, there's a song about it, you know, a modern song. And people shout it and scream it and they say, Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. It's talking about freedom from the law, ladies and gentlemen. You're set free from the chains of sin. Chains of sin? Yes. The law chained you up. It bound you. And he puts those chains on you and the devil drags you and the world drags you according to the course of this world and you follow it and you're dragged along and you think you're making these decisions on your own but I promise you it's your sin nature following the devil and the Lord breaks those chains of sin that's the liberty the Lord's speaking of those prison doors are flung open and you are set free there's no judge waiting to throw you back into the sin into the jail of sin there's no posse gathering outside to hunt you down the executioner has stayed his hand that red telephone rings just as they're about to execute you and the voice on the other end declares that all demands against you have been satisfied hallelujah by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the seal of the resurrection of Jesus Christ God gives you peace Under the principle of justification, pardoned, the record is purged, purified. You are in this place now 
of peace. What a wonderful thing. Ladies and gentlemen, what the Corinthian, what the Judaizers wanted to do was bring them back and say, you need to be bound up again. Here's your set of rules. Follow them. I spoke with someone recently. I don't remember where I was. Yes, I do, but I'm not going to say. I just remembered. And they said, I saw a church. I was up in such and such a state, and I visited a church, and I saw a church. And I'm telling you, it ain't like it is down where we were. I said, yeah, how was it? He said, why? They require everybody there to wear a suit and a tie, even the little children. And the women and their dresses that they wear and how they wear their hair and all these things. Why, you can set your little record of everything you want, ladies and gentlemen. But I'm telling you, the Lord Jesus Christ broke the chains. You are free in Christ Jesus. Not to do whatever you want, but to do what he wants in your life. You are now set free to obey Jesus and follow him. Isn't that beautiful? That's what God has done. If you've never come to that place of justification, if you've never come to that place where you know you have a pardon in Christ Jesus, today's your day. Right now is the moment. And I want to encourage you right now to tell the Lord in your heart right now, Lord, he's talking about me and I need to repent and believe on Christ and I need to receive forgiveness. And I ask you to come into my life and set me free. You need to say that to him. Words to that effect. Words to that effect. Father, this is your invitation time. And I want to pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll use this time for your glory. Thank you for the transforming power of God. And I pray you'll work in our lives. In the hearts of everyone present. In the hearts of those that have listened on live stream. Make your presence felt. Make your presence known. All for the glory of God. This is your invitation time. To join him. If you've never come to Christ to come to Christ. If you need a moment of reconciliation to turn these steps into a place of prayer and seek the Lord. Follow Him. Obey Him. Do business with God this morning. Father, use this invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand and let's do business with God. You come on. People are already moving. You come on.
of God, ladies and gentlemen. Word of God. Uh, hand me your microphone, Jeremy. Brother Dale's going to be making his way up here, and he's going to pray, and we're going to have mercy and let him do it from down here on the floor. Um, well, I tell you, if my ankle and your, your knee or hip got together, we'd be in a fix. I want you to know it. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to continue to worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings and let the Lord bless you in this moment as you do so. I want to remind you of some things. Three o'clock, we have a deacon's meeting. At three and at four o'clock, finance will begin its work. If you are on a ministry team or a committee and you need, you think you need funds for your ministry team or committee, better get it to us quick. Because we're going to start working today, right? That's what we're going to do. So you be mindful of those things. And of course, 5 o'clock, we'll have our prayer meeting. Brother Bo's been out preaching. I think this is his last Sunday to be away. And he'll be back with us next week as far as I know. But he's been here every Sunday evening um, to um, be a part of our prayer ministry that he leads. Well, lead us in prayer, brother. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we do thank you for this day you've given us. We thank you for your mercy and grace that you rain down on us. Lord, as we take these offerings, I just pray that you'll give us good the discernment to use them in the best way we can for your glory. Lord, we again thank you for who you are, for what you do for us, and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 